In Acts chapter 3, uh, a great and a wonderful story comes, and Peter is at the, the forefront of it. How in the world did somebody who grew up as a fisherman, I mean, that was the family business, that's what they did, he probably loved fishing, but fishermen were rough kind of guys. I mean, their hands were rough, their language was probably rough, everything about them from a uh, would just be a, kind of a, a normal, hard-working lifestyle. But how does that person become an apostle and a missionary? John's also in this, and he and his brother James were called the Sons of Thunder. I, I think that's probably because they had quite the personality. They could be heard probably over everybody else. There probably have been a, been a few fusses and fights and maybe a few fist fights among those brothers. But God poured His love within them. Peter began the, became the one who would uh, be really the father there, the, one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem. John became the elder statesman, the beloved, Jesus called him, the tender one. He moved from being the sons of thunder to becoming the beloved, tender one that, that Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, John, take care of my mom. How does that happen? How does, how does it happen that our lives can be changed and touched and made good and made new? All the apostles, all those disciples, grew up in a culture, a Jewish culture, that they were very proud of a very religious culture uh, that was full of lukewarm followers and indifferent leaders. They had their own religious agenda, and because they were lukewarm and indifferent to the actual words of God and the movement of God, they actually crucified our Lord and Savior. That's the culture in which they lived and they grew up with. But Christ came to challenge all of them on the wrong things that they had in their life. And God always wants to move us from where we are to where we need to be, but we don't always like change. We don't like to move from where we are. We kind of like where we are. That's why we've chosen it. But when Christ came and showed them that there's a good way, that there's a better way, they felt the tug from heaven and they accepted the Lord and the Lord's ways in their life. And it wasn't an overnight change for them. They still had a, a lot of hard days. They were for three, well, two years, three years, and for some of them, three and a half years, they were with Jesus all the times, but yet they, they did, it wasn't an overnight change. They still had issues they had to face. And by the way, it won't be uh, overnight for us either. We're going to have issues. I, I, I'm just grateful that in my years of ministry that I'm not date stamped. And I go back and hear some of my messages and see, see some of the things that I, I've said and I've done. I just kind of cringe. I don't know if you're like that or not. I'm a work in progress. Uh, not where I should be, but like we all said, I'm grateful that I'm not what I used to be. Just grateful that the God is patient. I admit, change is necessary in my life. I hope you'll admit it too. Change is necessary in your life. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the transformational work that we all need. And until we do, as a church, you know what we're doing? We're just dressing up Christians putting on a new suit of clothes and uh, looking good to the world. But yet, when they stand before God, bare and naked, what will God see? I think what matters is not where we've been, but with God's help, where we're going. If it's all right with you, would you stand in honor of reading God's Word? Acts chapter 3, we're going to begin in Verse number one. Now Peter and John went up together 
to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, basically begging for any type of financial help he could get. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive from something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Jared always gets on to me for uh, not having a name for my sermons. Can't put them online unless he puts a name with them. I'm going to call this one Lame Man Walking. Let's pray. Father, you are the God who can, and we are the people in need. We don't come before you with pride and we don't come to brag about how good we are or what we've done for you and how proud you should be of us. Lord, we just come knowing that when your all-seeing eye looks at us, we're bare and naked before you. Our heart, our thoughts, our works this week, our words, our walk, you've seen us on our best time and you've seen us on our worst. And oh, how you love us. Oh, how you want to bless us. Oh, how much you have in store for us. Jesus, give us ears and eyes to see and to hear, and to know, to sense that today, on a rainy, cold January day, that everything is right and well in heaven, and you want us to you want to invite us in into the warmth of your throne room. Lord, may we say yes to your invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Jesus has died. He was buried. He rose again. Forty days he was with his disciples and others, private conversations, public meetings. Over 500 saw him at one time. What, a, what, a, what days that must have been. Everyone probably thought how wonderful it is to not only see Jesus, be, be in the very presence of the one who looked death in the face and defeated it. That the power of God was not only with him, but it just shone like the glory of the sun. How wonderful it must have been, but they had to watch him as he ascended back to glory. He said, stay together, one accord. Wait for the promise. The promise is what you need. The promise of the comfort of the Holy Spirit will come. He will bless you. He will touch you. The very essence of the very nature of God will be right there, like a fountain springing up within you. And it has happened. Blessings have occurred. They watched as 3,000, their lives, they repented and they changed and they became followers of Christ and were baptized and now their names are written down in heaven and, and all is good in their soul. What do you do next? They didn't have an agenda. Nothing other than the Holy Spirit's leadership and guidance in their life. So they wake up this day. What do we do on this day? Well, we'll just walk with God and listen. Hey, they're having prayer at the temple. Let's go to synagogue. 
Let's go join in afternoon prayers. Hey, that sounds like a good idea. Let's go. Let's give God praise. Let's, let's be with the people of God. Let's, it sounds like a wonderful, let's, come on, let's go. And as they are walking down in, to the temple to pray, they came to the eastern side of, of the temple, the eastern gate, the double gate, a wide gate. And as they were walking in, they saw a man there. A certain man, it says in verse 2. Probably overlooked by everyone else. But never overlooked by God. When you think that nobody's watching, God is watching. When you think nobody cares, nobody cares like Jesus. When you think that you're invisible, God has his eyes, his undivided attention upon you, upon your circumstances. Did you hear me? Not just with your ears, but with your heart. Did you hear that <clears throat> you have the undivided attention of the holy God of the universe who knows every breath, every beat of your heart, every impulse of your spirit? He cares. He knows how you feel and he knows how everyone else feels about you. He knows the pressures you're going through. He knows how inadequate you feel. No one felt as inadequate as this man. He could have stayed home. And he could have let other people wait on him. He had an excuse. He was lame from his mother's womb. This was his life. He knew nothing else. When he was a child, he probably saw the other children out playing. If he had brothers or sisters, they probably went out and played too. But he never had the right or the privilege to do such a thing. He could simply watch others as they had fun. And they probably wanted him to, but it didn't keep them from going out. This man could have just sat and done nothing, but he got up. We do not know his age, but what was his occupation? Maybe some people taught him a few things at home. I don't know if he could read. Probably not. His life was the life of being a beggar. How that must make one feel. I know that there are people today who almost make an occupation out of such. They would rather do that than go work a job. This man didn't have a choice. This is the only thing he could do. He was used to people looking down upon him. He was used to people feeling sorry for him. Matter of fact, people had to carry him to this eastern gate of the temple and laid them there and went off and did their work in their day. And they would have to come back and get him in the evening and carry him back home. Ask him what his day was like. He was, his day was like the day before. And the day before that. And the day before that. Just simply a beggar. All of us want to add value to life. All of us want to be a blessing to those around us. And yet how sometimes we feel when we can't do that. This man knew what it was like. He just laid there. It's at the temple that he's laying. The people that came to worship God. You think he knew about God? I'm sure that he did. People came every day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to pray. Do you think he prayed? I'm sure he did. And on this particular day, Peter and John are just walking by. And when he saw them, verse 3, walking by, he, he reached out with his voice. He had a voice. And he asked for money. And they saw him there. And they took notice. Look what it says 
and verse 4. And Peter, fixing his eyes on him, John, Peter said, look at us. Now, Peter got up that day, come on, with the Spirit of God within him, doing what the right thing was. Hey, let's go to, let's go to temple. Let's pray. But now he's starting to understand that this new life that God's given him, it's not his agenda. He knew the old life. He'd get up and go to work and, and be a fisherman all day. But now he's, he, he is on mission for God to catch different fish. Men, women, boys and girls. So when he, I wonder how many times Peter had walked through the Eastern Gate. I wonder how many times he may have passed this man and never saw him. But this time, he heard him, he looked, and this time, maybe for the first time, I don't know, he truly saw him, and he fixed his eyes. And he's listening, not to just the man, but he's listening to the Lord. Lord, are you going to want to do something for this man? Lord, do you see this man? You think his heart hurt a little bit for him? Think he cared? Think he wanted to make a difference? He looks at him. I love this. He, fig- he says, look at me. Look at me. He's trying to figure out, is this something that what God wants to do? By the way, not everybody's ready for a blessing from God, and you need to listen to the Spirit. You can't force what you want for them upon them. Only God can give it to them, and we know God wants to give it to them, right? In the same way, I hope you're listening. I hope you're listening. And in the same way that when God looks at you today, God wants better for you. I don't know that you want that. The same way for me. God wants to bless me. God wants to pour out heaven in my life. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that I could ask or think. God is that kind of a God. But are we willing? And and Peter wants to know, is this guy ready? He's looking at him. Look at me. He wants to see within him. We need to be very careful that we just don't bruise the fruit. Jesus was a gentleman. He was loving. He was kind. He was nice. As well as generous. Look at verse 5. He said, uh, he gave them his attention, expecting to receive from something from them. But Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. Church, listen to me. We need to be generous. That is the very nature of love. Don't tell me you're love if you're not willing to love. Love is an action word. Don't tell me you care if you're not willing to care. But beware of just throwing money at something. Matter of fact, I think it's um, in the society that we live today, the easiest thing we can do is throw money at something. We were talking about this this week. We were talking about benevolence. And, and Ricky, were you in the office when I said this? I, I believe you were. We were talking about benevolence. And I said, look, we, we have to be careful about throwing money at something. I, I, I'm okay with giving. Trust me, I am. But I, I think in our church has a benevolence fund. We have something else we call a generosity fund that we began when COVID began. But, but I, I just think that we need to hear that probably we're the benevolence fund. I mean, it's easier to just give money to something and walk away. But I wonder if God's got a mission and a work and he needs a missionary to do the work. Instead of just giving something financially and say, done my part, y'all go handle it. Instead of just hiring a preacher to do it, maybe... We're missionaries and we need to do it. Maybe there's things that God has where it's not just one person, it's all of us. I'm going to say it again. 
one accord. I know God can do more through a hundred than he can do with one, even though if one will allow him, he can do, he can change everything through one. Matter of fact, <laughs> Matthew 5, 41 says this, whoever compels you to go one mile, y'all know that verse? Whoever asks you to do one thing, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with them. Say it again, church. You only ask go one. Go two. Now, you know the story behind that. A, a Roman soldier could come, and, and if he was having to carry something, and you, he could see you, and he can lay it down and says, carry it. And legally, you had to carry it one mile. But go two. Don't just do what you have to do. Do more. Church, what we're called to do is do more. I'm grateful. If you're here and you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, with a good, strong, loud voice, say amen. amen. Praise God for that. But it's not just about, I think I got a, an amen out of a little one over there. Praise God. Look, let's not just get you to heaven. Let's go to the, let's go to the second mile and get someone else with us. Let's not just bless you. I want your family. I'm grateful that you have friends. I want Jesus to know them in a saving way too. You see, the, 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 the mentality of the world today is come do for me. But the mentality of the church is what God has done for me, I want someone else to have as well. If your bills are paid, praise God. But what about someone else's? If someone else is in need, have we, I don't mean this rudely, but have we trained ourselves to walk by them and they're just absolutely invisible to us? Peter looked at this man, fixed his eyes upon him and said, hey, silver and gold, I don't have. But church, there's a lot of things we don't have. But what we do have, I give to you. Don't talk to me today about what we can't do. Let's just do what we can. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in in my 35 years of being a pastor. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in and they tell you what we can't do. I just want to get past that. I want, to, I want to get to all those things. Fine, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this. Let's just ask Jesus what we can do. If, can we just start today doing that? I love this passage of Scripture because he looked beyond everything else. He looked at this man. I don't have anything else to give you, but what I do have, oh, what I have. Do you think Peter's heart was full when he was going to pray? Do you think that he was walking by, maybe going to church expecting, but not really expecting anything? Did you come to church today expecting? But wouldn't it be great, even if you weren't expecting, you could. Peter looked at him and said, what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and... He knew. Looking at this man, he knew. Matter of fact, if you had asked this man, what can I do for you? He would have said, well, just give me some money. No, no, no. How can I really help? Well, if you really want to know how you can help me, I wish I wasn't in this condition anymore. There's a lot of people that are walking and they've gotten grown accustomed to the condition that they're in. When God has so much more that he wants to do. Rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. Look in verse 7. And he took him by the right hand. I can't tell you how many times I've read this and never seen that. 
Did you did y'all see that faith? He looks at him. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up. Come on. You could have said, get up, and just looked at him. Come on. Well, they weren't ready. Peter's faith looked at him and says, come on, get up. Peter was all in on this. When I thought about that, I, I, I thought about another lame man who couldn't walk, who had four friends who carried him on his bed to where Jesus was. But when they found him, the, the, the place where Jesus was was so full of people that he couldn't get in. I'm sure they asked, can, can, you, can you let us through? I was here first. We got, a, we got a guy in here, we're trying to get to Jesus. Well, we're all trying to get to Jesus. So you know what those friends did? They went up on that flat house and just started tearing the ceiling up. I mean, that is radical. Right? And I think Jesus had the biggest smile on his face when the ceiling started to fall through and, and they made a great big hole. I mean, somebody would have had to shout and say, quit that, come on around, we'll let you in. But they just tore the ceiling out and they lowered him down in there. And Jesus' words were, when he looked at the lame man's friends and the faith of the lame man's friends, Jesus healed the lame man. I wonder in this particular case, if it was Peter's faith that God was waiting for, you believe this, you say that you have faith, you know this, are you going to do something with it? And Peter reached out his hand to grab him and help him up, and God said, amen, get up. And his feet became strong, and his angles became strong, and, it, it, and his arms probably had atrophied because he had never used them. His, his leg, did I say his arms? His legs were probably the size of my arm. Probably those skin and bones and those legs became strong. Look what it says in verse 7. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he leap, leaping up. So he leaping up. <laughs> he couldn't just stand. He could jump. He stood and he walked and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. He didn't just stand up. He had never done this in his life. But he did what he could not do by the power of God, what God had done for others. By the way, now, what God had done for others that they took for granted. How many of you got up this morning and took for granted the ability to stand up and walk? Every one of us. I doubt there was one person in this building that stood up and said, I am so grateful. Lord, today you allow me to stand up. You may have prayed, Lord, thank you for letting me stand up and stay standing up. Right? Man, he got up. Brother Mark, they didn't have to say, all right, everybody, we're going to cheer together. No, no, no. This man became a worship director right then and there. He wasn't caring. He was praising God. Uh, he was charismatic. He was jumping and shouting, and he didn't care. Um, don't you think that'd be nice if we got a little charismatic every now and again because of what Jesus has done for us? Yes, Are you too worried that somebody might look at you and say, the preacher just got out of line today? Maybe God's up there saying, boy, you got two big feet, jump. That's about as high as I can jump nowadays. He followed them in the temple. Did you catch that? Every day what he did was he watched others enter the temple. Now he's going on his own. Well, he's not going on his own. The Lord's with him. And everybody's looking around and saying, what in the world is this all about? It's like, a, it's like two kids in the playground. They get in a fight and everybody goes around them. 
They're, they're, they're looking at this and they're saying, hey, is, not, is that not the, the guy that's been laying? At the, the cripple. Somebody probably said, I gave him $5 last week. I tell you what, I didn't know he could walk. <laughs> no, we know that man. And he's praising God and he's, he's giving God glory for what God has done in his life. I love this. Look in verse number 11. And Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, he got a hold up and he wouldn't turn loose. You're not leaving me. What you got that I now have, I don't want to lose it. My dad told the story about a man who got saved who came to church. He was there Sunday morning. He was there Sunday night. He was there Wednesday night. He got so full of God, he wanted to go everything. He even went to the WMU meetings. For those of y'all who don't know, that was the ladies' meeting. He didn't care. He held on to something because something had got a hold of him. Verse 12, when Peter saw it, all the people are running together. In verse 11, Peter saw it. He responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? <laughs> I love this. The one who would have been marveling before when he saw all that Jesus did, he marveled. Now he's saying, this is nothing to marvel about. This is just something that's normal. He said, why look so intently at us as though our own power or godliness has made this man walk? He is being very humble about this. It's not about him. It's about Jesus. And he was very quick to point it to the Lord. As a matter of fact, he just said, this is a good time for a sermon. And he just broke off in a sermon. <laughs> Preacher. Always looking for a crowd. Wherever he was, he's just going to have a sermon for him. But he also gave an invitation. Look in verse 19. He gives them the sermon, then he looks at them and says, you know what you need to do? Repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted. He didn't say get dressed up like a Christian. He didn't say you need to give more money. He didn't say, are you honoring your father and mother? He looked at him and said, the things that you know that are in your life that you should not be doing, turn from. By the way, this is the plan of salvation. If you come to church today and I'm up here preaching, and you say, you know what? I think I would like to get to heaven. Uh, can I have a little bit of that heaven? Sure, you can have all of it you want. Change. Oh, now I didn't just say repent because, see, that's a religious word. Change. How many of y'all want to change? Oh, I've already been saved. I don't need to change. Really? I mean, the Lord's going to be so glad when you get to heaven, he can look at you and say, you know, I've been sitting on this throne for a while, but now that you're here, why don't you sit down on it? You got it all figured out. In 2023, the word that I want to see God do in my life is I want to see him change me. I need it, folks. You know me. You know I need it. I want it. I don't want anything to get in the way of it. I'm sick and tired of Brian. Don't say amen to that. The things that we've grown accustomed to. The things that we walk by where God's work are we missionaries? Or are we just recipients of God's grace? Do we want to be used? Do we want to be a blessing? Do we want to see the fire fall on a cold, rainy day? Do we want to see the Holy Spirit have His way in our lives? One with Him, one with each other? See, there's a lot of needs that we have that people need to have met. In 
And if we're not doing that, why are we a church? This is a place where the power of God is supposed to reside and fall in our hearts. Not just to bless us, but so that we can be blessed and be a blessing. Peter didn't have an agenda that day, but he was on mission for God. He didn't know where it was going to take him. So when he went to the temple that day, he really wasn't expecting, but he was expecting. When you wake up tomorrow morning, or even the rest of this day, are you expecting to see a miracle? It says that they were moved with amazement and wonder. How long has it been? 